usury laws. Let's go back to a period when, uh, before Volcker, you had a 10% limit on credit card interest rates that were set by the states, and we could do, it, we could do that again. You want to re-regulate financial markets so that it's impossible for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley to drive up the price of oil to $150 a barrel the way they did in the summer of 2008. So with those types of measures, you've stopped speculation or discouraged it, and you've diminished this tremendous weight of zombie banks, because a lot of the zombie banks would be put through liquidation, and their derivatives would simply be written off. Then you need to nationalize the Federal Reserve. You've got to get control of the process of creating credit. You've got to seize the Fed, nationalize it. It means that zombie bankers and cliques of unaccountable and unelected financiers no longer set policy for the entire United States. The size of the money supply, the interest rates, and who gets these loans is determined by public laws discussed and debated openly by Congress signed by the president. That's all we have under our system. Once you have a National Bank of the United States, you start issuing tranches of credit, $1 trillion at a time. The only trick you have to do is make sure it goes only for production, for farming, for manufacturing, industry, construction, mining, forestry, scientific research, uh, retail sales, yes, uh, got to get the goods to market. You've also got to put money into transportation, be it rail, uh, freight, and things like this. Uh, if you make sure that it only goes into production, there is no inflation. As a matter of fact, commodities tend to get cheaper. The goal of this is to create 30 million productive jobs. Right now, the U.S. unemployment rate is officially 15 million. The best guess is that in reality, we would need 30 million productive jobs to approach full employment. So if you come forward, if you're an industrialist, if you want to take Detroit auto plants and get them going again, reconvert them and rehire the workers and manufacture something that people need, you get 0%. But if you're a banker, a speculator, financial services, sorry, you go take your chances in the free market that you admire so much. You've got credit being offered by the nationalized Fed. You've got to stimulate lending. Lending and borrowing. So you've got lending from the Fed. You've got to find borrowers. So what you've got to do is to create great projects of infrastructure. And this is really the heart of the program. You've got to say that the money coming out of the Fed as 0% public credit goes into specific infrastructure projects that we know will increase the capital stock of the United States and increase the productivity of labor. The first thing you're going to need is 50,000 miles of the most modern maglev rail. Rebuild the entire collapsing transit systems, be it passenger, freight, commuter rail, with the most modern maglev technology, pioneered by Germany and now being used in Japan and China, but not here, even though the technology came out of the U.S. 1,000 hospitals with about 500 beds each. You want to have medical care? First thing you need is hospitals. We've lost 1,000. In the rural America and inner cities, hospitals are far, hard to find. People die from heart attacks because the hospital is too far away. Build 1,000 of the most modern hospitals, and you will get up to what was considered the minimum rate in the Hill-Burton Law of 1946. It said we should aim at 4.5 hospital beds per thousand population. Right now we're at 3.2, so we ought to build those hospital beds. We would need 100 nuclear reactors of the most modern type. Fourth generation, high temperature, pebble bed reactors, 1,000 to 2,000 megawatts each to maintain an electricity grid and to replace older reactors that are now becoming increasingly obsolete. You've got to rebuild the entire interstate highway system. It was a great thing under Eisenhower, the biggest road-building project since the Romans, but it's now falling down. The Minneapolis bridge over the Mississippi River, bridges in Connecticut and elsewhere. That has all got to be rebuilt. The other thing is water systems. Drinking water, sewage treatment, wastewater, canals, and irrigation. All of that has got to be rebuilt from the bottom up. So you put that together, 100 reactors, 1,000 hospitals, 50,000 miles of maglev, the interstates and the water systems, you have created millions and millions of high-paid 
jobs in creating capital goods and infrastructure of permanent value. This is not consumer goods. This stays with you and gives you a permanent advantage. The other thing you need is science drivers. Remember the NASA moonshot. It generated the spin-offs that gave you computer chips and the whole computer-based economy came out of the space program. So let's do that again. Let's put a hundred billion dollars each first into high energy physics. Let's get into lasers, let's get into thermonuclear fusion power and other advanced scientific applications. Second one is moon Mars exploration, colonization on a permanent basis and industrial production. Do all this obviously together with other interested countries. But let's begin to go into space on a permanent basis and, uh, and use that for economic benefits. The third one is biomedical research. You're talking about health care. The only way you can save costs and, and uh, spend less money in health care, other than genocide, is to find cures. You want to save money on cancer? Don't deny people treatment. Find a cure. Cure it. Diabetes, heart disease, and all the other dread diseases can find cures. So begin to put money into that, and obviously make that an international program, too. The fourth point is, while you're doing all this, you've got to keep people alive. So you've got to maintain your social safety net. Full funding at enhanced levels for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment benefits, food stamps, uh, minimum wage, and all the rest. And you've got to think about health care in particular. The only way you can save money is to find cures. The fifth point is world trade. You've got to have an international monetary approach to this. Set up a system with fixed parities, gold settlement, the yen, the euro, the dollar, the ruble, the Arabs, the Latin Americans. But the goal of this is not currency stability or anything to do with monetarism per se. It's to start high technology capital goods exports from those Detroit auto plants that you've reconverted and other facilities in the U.S. Start exporting hospitals. Build a thousand hospitals for China. Build a thousand hospitals for Russia. Then look at the great projects of world infrastructure that uh, remain undone. Look at the Bering Strait Bridge Tunnel. Look at the one for Gibraltar, for the Straits of Sicily. Uh, connect Japan to the Asian mainland. Do the Congo Nile uh, equivalent to the Tennessee Valley Authority. Do the same thing for the the uh, Amazon, the Orinoco, and the Rio de la Plata. Do it for the Ganges, Brahmaputra in Asia, and the Mekong as well. In other words, get the great projects of world infrastructure that have been on the drawing boards now for decades and do them. Uh, that means a Cape to Cairo, Dakar to Djibouti, Maglev. Essentially, unite all the land areas of the world using Maglev rail. So you could deliver a package from any point in the world to any other point within approximately 48 hours on a railroad platform uh, and use that then to prepare a further advance. But you'd end the depression. You want to do that, uh, you will create 30 million new highly paid industrial jobs, productive jobs in the United States. You will stop the depression. You will rebuild the U.S. economy. You will improve wages and standards of living. You will restart productive investment. You will restore corporate profits of industrial capital. You will get to full employment. We haven't seen full employment in this country since 1945. So that would be quite a change. And you will have increased levels of capital investment per job, which is the key for getting uh, actual profits out of this. My estimate is that you'd be back into a budget surplus within five years and you'd have a trade surplus within five years or less. The main point about Detroit is you look at those factories, right? You can still see Henry Ford's River Rouge plant. You can see the various uh, plants of the, of the big three automakers which have absorbed other companies over the years. Those factories could lift the world, and now they're closing down. Why should we have an empty auto plant and unemployed auto workers, when people around the world and in this country need the products that could come out of those factories, why don't we nationalize the Federal Reserve and get those auto workers back to work reconverting auto plants to build things like tractors for African farmers, 
We could build high-speed rail, maglev rail for urban mass transit and uh, passenger rail, freight rail here in the United States. You could build aerospace equipment. You could build nuclear reactors. You could build modular housing. You could build modular components for factory buildings, modular hospitals that you could plunk down in rural Russia and rural China. The only missing ingredient is credit. You go to Bernanke and say, Ben, I need a loan from the Federal Reserve to reconvert the Detroit automakers. And Ben says, no. He says, we have 0% credit, but only if you're a bank. Not if you want to produce. Only if you want insurance, derivatives, credit cards, and the rest of it. But if you want to actually create a tangible, physical product, a, a manufactured commodity, we have no time for you. You look at the history of the automobile industry. They were producing autos into 1941. When Roosevelt's Lend-Lease began to kick in, it began to convert from manufacturing cars for a still somewhat depressed domestic market to manufacturing war material, defense goods, first for the British until the middle of 1941, and then also for the Soviets after the middle of 1941. So you can go from building cars in 1940-41 to building B-17s and B-29s. Now that essentially means you can reconvert those factories to do literally anything. The only missing ingredient is credit and political will. And you better get those tool and die people, those productive auto workers, back in before they get too old because you've got to train a new generation. Once those abilities are lost, they're lost. So use them or lose them. After 1945, the UAW with Walter Ruther proposed a series of reconversions to convert out of war production into other things to promote uh, locomotives, mass transit, and to promote other kinds of diversified production from Detroit. So the great task today is to realize that if you don't have industrial production, you're going to become ethnographic material. If you don't have factories that produce capital goods and high value added, high, high capital intensity products that you can export, you're going to become the object of study for Chinese anthropologists who are going to come over and look at this strange civilization where people think that derivatives have value and hedge funds have value, but Detroit auto plants and other kinds of productive plant and equipment have no value. So you can either learn Chinese so that you can talk to the anthropologists who are going to come and study this queer, uh, exotic form of life that we have here in North America, or you can gear up production and get back to the path of measures that have worked well in the past and will work even better in the future. Cheap labor means low profits. The success of the United States was as a high-wage economy. You try to turn the U.S. into a low-wage economy, that's a recipe for ruin. We need to have a high-wage economy, and the Republican Party should learn from even somebody like Henry Ford, who knew that if you don't pay the automobile workers a living wage, they can't buy your products. It's just that simple. So instead of being the party of low-wage sweatshops uh, across the country, the Republican Party ought to reform themselves and fight for what we have to call industrial capital. Industrial capitalism works. That's what the U.S. has functioned on, and that's what has gotten us successes. Finance capital does not work. And what we have today is a situation where the finance capitalists run the government, they dictate the policies, and finance capital is in the process of crushing industrial capital, see the demise of the auto industry, and also crushing commercial capital.